when white people first came here, they found a paradise, they found abundance, they found a completely clean and unspoiled environment. Because Indigenous people treat everything with respect and reverence and understand that there's a spiritual aspect to anything that is physically manifest. That's what we need to learn. Hey there, my name's Tamsin Ravel, and this is where my story began, right here in this paddock. You see, I used to spray weeds with chemicals for 13 years. Two years ago, I stopped. Obviously wasn't working. It also coincided with my uh, being diagnosed with an autoimmune disease. I then had an emotional and a physical breakdown. As I looked around, I realised that our norms have shifted. It's normal for a mum to have an autoimmune disease. It's normal for a, our children to be popping pills because of disease and allergies. It's normal for our farmers to commit suicide. We're losing one a week. This is not normal. So I did a bit of research and I found out that industrial and intensive farming is at the detriment to all of us, especially our children. Our environment and our animals are suffering. Our rivers have stopped flowing. This country is in drought. We have lost connection with our land. 2016 was the worst year of my life. I looked up to our skies and they were empty. My wedge-tailed eagles had disappeared. I was on my own. Mother Nature was demanding answers and I knew I had to go and find them. So I went and sat in on conference after conference, soil, farming, and beekeeping. And the people I met were incredible people, regenerative people, pioneers paving the way into a future, a future that our children will be proud of. So I'd like you to come and join me. Come and meet these people. We'll go and have a chat. Let's speak to Jeremy Bradley. He's a soil microbiologist and he's going to explain what our soil needs to be really healthy. Well, a healthy soil is different for different farming operations. I, I define a healthy soil as one that is self-regenerating and fit for purpose. Well, carbon is really the key driver to fertility. Uh, carbon is able to store uh, nutrients, carbon is able to store moisture, carbon is able to be uh, an energy reserve for the plants in, in dry times and the carbon is uh, stored in the soil or what we call sequestered in the soil um, by a symbiotic relationship with uh, the fungi and, and fungi in this particular type of soil was the most important microbe that we uh, fostered the growth of in, in this restorative uh, practice. So when you had a look at your soil and it was concrete and, and really dusty and mm. there wasn't much living in it, is that the first thing that you did was introduce that? We did. We, 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 looked at, uh, we looked at that soil under a microscope and we could see that uh, of the key elements of the food web, the one that was mostly lacking was the fungi. And, and the fungi is the organiser of the soil. I like to think of the fungi as controlling the feng shui of the soil. It sounds like you're very, very passionate about fungi. Um, it is so important and yet why is it so misunderstood? How did you uh, transfer the, the fungi that you needed into your soil? Well, a lot of microbiologists, and myself included, um, feel that you need to actually use the type of uh, microbes that actually made your local soil in the first place. So, so to get the best fungi for your farm, you need to go and look in places where the, uh, the, the soil is in its more natural condition and you need to be able to be looking for places where the fungi is well established in the leaf litter. Uh, then you introduce that into your compost or your compost teas. I mean, this uh, type of uh, leaf litter here is, um, you could virtually put that straight into a compost tea and, and brew that up. And uh, you would have the ability to introduce this localised fungi into your farming system. We're here at uh, Rod's worm farm. He's uh, doing some vermiculture. 
He just would like to explain through uh, the farming of the worms, the compost tea, and uh, how he's integrated it into the industrial way of farming to try and get into the regenerative way. And how long have you been doing this here? About 20 years. Basically, we're feeding worms on what they're going to get in the paddock. We're using compost worms to, to get what comes, you know, what, what they're going to get naturally back in the paddock. That, trying to promote biology that'll survive in these what can be pretty harsh conditions. So is this a special worm? No, they're just a mixture of compost worms we bought. There's red blues and tigers in them, but it's the tigers seem to be able to handle the heat better. Worms are basically a bacterial dominated system, but we, we do get some pretty good fungal numbers in here. Um, it took a long time. Do you test for the fungi? For a lot of testing, yep. Yeah. Over the years, you had to get the recipe right. A lot more carbon source than normal. And where do you get that carbon from? So, through, through the source. Through here. A little bit of wood chip, cardboard. Have you got any sort of secret recipe? Well, the only secret recipe would be to go to patches of scrub that are well away from the spray lines or where you're spraying. And just get in the middle of the scrub there, especially after rain, which hasn't happened all that often lately. <laughs> but um, yeah, just get the fungi out of the scrub. So you're actually taking two things then, because you're taking off the worm juice, mm. which you're then mixing and spraying onto the paddock. Yeah, we, but we mainly use the worm juice, only as a foliar. And then you've got your fungi piles. The fungi piles here, what we'll do the brewing with, or the extraction with. So. You've got your seed that yep. you want to plant. Yep. You mix it up with your inoculant, yep. which is the rhizobia yep. and the worm and, juice. And worm juice, yeah. And then um, you spray the seed with the inoculant all yeah. covered. As it goes into the cart, yeah. Okay. Yeah. And then you sow your seeds. Yep. And the seed's taking the goodness with it the seeds because it's the, coated in it. The seeds are coated with the rhizobes and the worm juice and it's straight in the green where it wants to be. And then off it goes. And away it goes, yeah. Yeah. And you found that it is significantly better? We think so. Yeah. Yeah, from, from, from what? What have you actually seen? Some pretty incredible nodulation. Three quarters of an inch across, you know, about 19 mil. Ball of um, rhizobe on, uh, on favour beans and Compared chick, to chickpeas. Oh, they're usually fairly small. Really, because of the worm juice is very bacterial. And that's what Roy's over like. Okay. Now they're bacteria too, so. And then with the fungi juice, you come in and the spray it. The fungal stuff that's best as a liquid inject. What does that mean? That goes in at planting, that goes down the fertilizer tubes at planting. Ah, oh, so as you're sowing. Yep. So yeah. you've now got three biological applications on that yep. one seed. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, well it's in the trench right next to it or just, just above it. Yeah. Okay. And that's and the idea of that is get the fungi in, especially the VAM. We do use some of NTS's products on that one to boost the VAM numbers and uh, trichoderma. So that specific types of fungi they got in there, and we plus your locals plus we plus to, we put the local <laughs> blokes in there to help okay. too. And they, they know their way around and just re reintroducing them because I don't think there's any argument these days that industrial farmers knock the hell out of them. Yeah. Um, well, you know, there will be some blokes I argue that it doesn't do it. But, but it's not instant, though, is it? Oh, so sometimes you do. You get it mainly with the foliage. You get a pretty good response pretty well instantly. You can, you know, get a bit of a colour change or something like that. But quite often it's it's two, three, four years before you start to see it turn around. And, and that's what you've witnessed with the trials that you've done. Yeah. Um, yeah. And and as we've We've sort of got out of the trial phase now. We're doing the whole farm now. Yeah, pretty good examples. You can jump through the neighbour's fence. They'll have, especially in the dry times, they'll have stubble that's from a sorghum crop they had two or three years before. It's still there, it's still laying on the ground, and all else is gone. So nothing's munched it. Nothing's munched it. They've got nothing left to chew yeah. it up. So what does all this really mean? I'd like you to meet Sarah from Bear Biologics, who is going to explain how to keep our soil alive. What are soil microbes and why is the biology so important for growing food? I, I think we're going to actually find, if we put it, it's a different way of thinking about things, I suppose, but um, a lot of our soils are actually starving. 
Yeah. We actually, you know, and so when we start building up the biology and, and starting to recognise the biology, um, we do remember have to remember that we then have to think of them as mouths to feed mm. and we have to then balance that as well because we've, we've sort of woken up the engine and they, therefore they're yeah. going to need... They need fuel. They need fuel. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, those... we're sustaining them and then we're also sustaining our crop, but it's a win-win. Yeah. So there's um, no competition. That's kind of a myth. Yeah. Mm. And we're really showing with examples like this that that's not how it is. We've actually got a lot of synergy happening and a benefit. When we're talking about feeding them, so if we artificially feed them with man-made stuff, we're not talking about MPK or any of the synthetic fertilisers. What's the difference between the biological and, and the synthetics? Um, well, that's a whole topic in itself, but I guess biological is products that I feel personally don't interfere with the communication networks that we're trying to re-establish, um, and they still give the microbes the job. If you have a synthetic, they tend to be in soil solution, they're available immediately. The plant gets them through mass flow or diffusion or interception, which they think is the, the main ways, whereas really majority of nutrition in an ideal sense for a plant is, geez, I would like some of this, and the message goes out and the biology gets them that and okay. gives it to them. It's making sure that we don't let them go redundant. Right. You, 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 they've got a purpose. <laughs> well, and, and, and microbe. So they've, they've got a job. Um, make sure they get to do it. Otherwise yeah. they've, you know, they go to sleep or they exit the location, yeah. if, you know. So if we, yeah, keep putting in what we think the plant wants, that's fine for a production sense, yeah. yield. Yeah. But we need to have a look at the hole here and the capacity building of this soil so that it could keep on giving. Why does some land look healthier than others? Let's see how different regenerative pasture looks and what does this actually mean at grassroots level. These samples are taken from the same land about 10 metres apart representing uh, different techniques, farming techniques. One is district common practice and the other one has been uh, regeneratively farmed for 15 years. How do they differ? Well, as you said, the, the one is from a district common practice, which is um, basically grazing uh, with no restriction on where the cows go um, and not a lot of inputs. Um, the, the cattle trample all over the, the ground continuously every day. Whereas on uh, our side of the fence, the grazing is closely managed, like a, you know, just like a holistic system. Um, but we also follow up with uh, occasional with mulchings uh, and uh, compost tea applications. Does that have an effect on the moisture carrying capacity? Well, it has a, a, an immediate effect on, on the uh, ability of the soil to absorb moisture. As you can imagine, this soil here is more like a concrete. And if a, if a sudden rainfall event happened here, it would all run off down to the creek, carrying a great deal of the nutrients that have accumulated here during the dry period into the waterways along with it. Whereas uh, in the biologically managed soil, the one that we've managed for soil regeneration, all the water would be going in because the fungi is actually holding those par particles apart. There's galleries down through the soil. And as I said, that's the feng shui, where the, where the entrances and exits and breezeways, the way that the atmosphere can get in and out, the way that the soil can actually respire. Uh, a healthy soil breathes in during the, the nighttime and breathes out during the daytime as, uh, as the air expands and contracts. And that brings fresh nitrogen into the system and the microbes can then turn that nitrogen into protein and the other members of the food web consume that and make the nitrogen plant available. Now that we understand how important healthy soil is, I'd like you to meet Martin Williams from Ningen Seed Graders. The seeds that we use to produce our food are also extremely important, 
So he's going to explain why seed grading and regenerative farming is crucial to producing healthy food. One thing with grain, it's a living thing. So because it's living, we want to keep it alive and we want to look after it the best we can. This is an asset that we're going to plant. By regenerating your soil, you can actually have an influence on your seed, can't you? Absolutely. I did a course with Hugh Lovell oh, a fair while ago and he had five jars of seed. It was corn that he'd grown. He used the one seed to grow the next one and then that seed to grow the next one to the next one to the next one. And Hugh worked really hard on the nutrition for that seed and for the plants that grew it. There's no um, peer-reviewed scientific uh, evidence on this, but I was looking at those five jars of seed and my eyes told me that that seed was getting better as it progressed. If we can regenerate seed moving forward like that, you know, just the opposite's happening in, in our system when we're degenerating our land. It's not as good for our seed. And that's why our seed varieties don't go the distance anymore. The other thing is that the plant breeders, they are all set in there. Um, when they do their new plant breeding, they put it out and they do the plant breeding with a full dose of fertiliser. So some of the modern plant varieties, they've been bred to go with a, with a full shot in the arm, in and on the system. All right, so when you take one of those seeds and do your regenerative farming... It might not necessarily work, that's right. And so um, I know Haggerty's in Western Australia, they, when they turned it all around, they ended up getting better results with old variety seeds. So with those seeds, they're going downhill yeah, that, they're, um, We're going into degenerated soil and we're, they're, they're having a harder time. But then the geneticists and the plant breeders, they've been fiddling around breeding disease resistance and that sort of thing into it. But the thing is, it just goes to show that we're not winning because if we won, we would have been able to stop and we would have been happy with the, ne with the next variety that they gave us, right? They did everything right, we're doing everything right, the next variety is the one and it all halts there, but it doesn't. The farming community just keeps degenerating the soil and then the seed breeders are one step in front and then that one drops off and they've got to have another one. The band-aids get bigger and more expensive. And with your business, your seed grading business, uh, you have two t different types of grading machines. Yeah, so uh, most of the time in the seed grading season, I just work for the monoculture croppers and we're just running monoculture uh, seed lines through the machine, taking out the weed seeds, uh, taking out chaff and sticks and straw and that sort of thing and tidying it up so that it'll, it'll go through the uh, metering systems on their planting machinery. And that's specifically to re-sow or to sell? Nearly all of the stuff that I do is seed that's kept on farm by the farmers. So they harvest it at harvest time, put it in a seed silo, and then I come along, run it through my machine. Most of the work I do, the grain is for seed. And so describe how you actually grade the mixed species. The last crop we did out there was a seven way mix and we graded it up. So with the grading machinery that, that we were using there, what we did is we, uh, we took off a big, a medium, a small and a long. That's a fairly easy grade with um, screening machines, indent machines and aspirators. So the big is like a, a, a pea or a lupin or a faba bean. Then the medium could be a wheat, a barley, triticale, and then the long more likely not would be the oats and the, um, and the small could be a canola or a radish. The fantastic thing about the mixed species is that when you grow a seven way mix, is that we've got to bet every which way. You know, like when it goes out there, it's going to be different every year depending on the season. And one of the things that was um, pretty spectacular was that it actually changed as you walked across the paddock. And you did, it wasn't like you had to drive a kilometre over there for it to be different. Sometimes it was, like, as every step nearly, or every two steps you took, you were surrounded by a little different ecosystem. So whoever fitted the system best right there, he was going the best. And he sometimes was shading out the other fella or whatever, but you know, the little guy just wasn't in his, his space there. But you can go over there another five metres, and then you know, where you've got a little oat plant here, you go over there a bit, you've got a big oat plant. That was really fantastic to see the dynamic of how that, um, that mixed species grows in there. By planting a the monoculture out there, we're really, we're really limiting our potential. 
Mixed species planting, also known as multi-species, isn't just used within the cropping industry. Multi-species can be oversown into pasture. We are on Katie and Brad's farm just outside Wagga Wagga. They produce sheep and have used multi-species to keep both their livestock and soil healthy. So the purpose of the multi-species pasture crop is to promote your soil life basically and the reason that we have eight species plus is because there's been lots of research done by world leader Dr Christine Jones in this field and she says that eight plus species is what is most effective in activating your soil life. Because there's bigger diversity, different roots yep. grow different fungi, yep. different bacteria, yep. protozoa, everything that's else. Is everything that's, that's in, in the there. Soil. Right. Yeah. Okay. And nowhere in nature do you see a monoculture. No. No. So the more species you can get into um, the soil, the better. And it, you know, not just in the soil with the root density and shape and what effect it's ha having there, but also the canopy above the soil. You sort of like a forest. You have a, a ground level, mm. then you have a mid level, then you have a tall level, yeah. and all of those things do different. Um, provide different services to the soil and to the animals. So in this paddock, we literally planted bird seed this year. So the aim of planting the bird seed was to have a multi-species crop. Um, some of them would be spreading, some of them would be tall, some of them would be putting nitrogen into the soil, some would be putting other things in, some would be busting the soil up. We actually planted thistles. We did. Okay. And we found that actually the cheapest, most cost effective way for us to do that, to get a variety of species that we wanted, was to go to the local stock feed supplier and actually buy bird seed. Okay. So this is a parrot mix um, that and we. You didn't have the birds that we sowed? The seed? No, not so far. Um, we did sow two different types of millet in here as well. They've obviously been eaten off now. Um, so how many different species do you think were in that? 13. Yeah, 13. Now, is this the first year you've played with this? Uh, with the bird with, seed mix, yes it is, but it won't be the last. Okay. So and we have planted multi-species crops before, but generally three or four species. Now that we have healthy seeds planted in regeneratively managed soil, Let's have a closer look at the plant's health by going underground and checking out the root systems. We are back on farm with Sarah to look at three different species of plants. Each one has a specific job to do. So yeah. see how the roots, instead of being all skinny like that, they've actually got, um, you know, what's Yeah, that so the, these white ones are sort of not healthy roots? They're, they're okay still, but okay. these ones are forming a nice rhizosphere. Yeah, right. so the yep. biology helps all that so that they're the roots in the soil yeah, sort of talk to each other so in that zone. They're just dreads. I love them. Yeah, yeah so like... it's dreadlocks. And, and there, yeah, there's a community in there. We've got community um, dynamics. We've got communication. And the scientists are finding that we've actually got, you know, Christine Jones will um, tell us that we've actually got nitrogen fixes in there. So even though this is a plant that's not usually seen to be a plant that's, you know, producing its own nitrogen, in its rhizosphere and in its community dynamic yeah. it's got nitrogen being produced there so this plant why oats is great is it's highly yeah, mycorrhizal these mycorrhizal fungal spores live in the soil they germinate when a plant's root is close by and attach themselves actually growing inside the root structure the photosynthesizing plant exchanges sugars for nutrients and minerals the mycorrhizal fungi also grow an extensive hyphae network around the outside of the root creating a healthy rhizosphere that's the area directly around the roots known as dreads. This in turn increases the surface area, adding a secondary root system to the plant. This strong root system creates the mineral uptake the plant needs to produce superior quality food. And it feels cool. It does, yeah. yeah it's yeah. really almost cold. Yeah, so yeah. we only had three and a half mils just, this, just overnight. You know, so it's not a lot. Yeah, well, it doesn't look like you've had anything from the surface. No. Um, <laughs> it's yet, really yeah, dry, it's... doesn't it? But that's quite cool. Yeah, yeah it is. Wow. That's yeah. so, so good. The next plant is called a Dakin tillage radish. 
This is a brilliant concept by which a plant is used to break up compaction and helps feed the soil too. See how it's got all the roots coming off it and it's almost little micro colonies in there, isn't there? Yeah. So and often, you know, you usually just you see the, the big the tuber. Big tuber. Yeah. But we've got these great little micro communities happening as well. And the purpose yeah. of this? Well, it's called a lots of radish. So yeah. it's almost like trying to till the soil without steel. They also bring nutrients in and up as well. Oh, so they become deeper. yeah. So they become like a, a storage vessel oh. for moisture and nutrients. Yeah. Um, that they're yeah brought from further down. But as they're doing that, they're creating this lovely um, bigger active zone that they're moving the soil. So, so it's not just where the, the tap root's going down, it's actually having a knock-on effect round, like yep. a bit like sort of ripples yep. coming off yeah. the... And, you know, once this does die and it starts to break down, you've got then, you know, like a, a living plant form of fertiliser okay. package yep. positioned there that'll decompose, which is feeding the biology, ah. which is then feeding whatever is growing around it. Okay. You know, so it's a sort of a nice little closed loop. Mm. And as that then totally decomposes, because they do actually break down quite quickly yep. when you've got heat and moisture, yep. then it's actually also a tunnel where when it does rain, yeah, moisture, moisture will go in and it'll go down further yep. to the point of where that tuber ends. We're at Wilgervale Organic Wonders. Ronnie and James understand that to produce healthy chemical-free food, the root system must first be strong. Wow. We are at Wow Farm, after all. Sorry. So you've got the crumbly structure yep. happening too. That's what we want to see. Yeah. I mean, that's a lovely massive root system there. Smells it's holding great. onto that soil. So. Yeah. It's holding on. Yeah. yeah. You know. But yeah. just, so the roots I've seen, we like dreads. So, so there's not the dreads there. So veggies, these are a bit different because okay. these are a brassica. Yeah. Brassicas aren't the same. Um, they're not mycorrhizal plants oh. like those other ones that you've seen yep. so there is that difference, difference of how they tend to get a lot of their nutrition but slightly these are different because they've got small hairs yeah but you've got a really active healthy root okay. there so yeah. an unhealthy plant what would it, it would just be really loose would it or? oh and a fraction of the size of the root system okay hmm. yeah these these have all broken off too because you get right down to lots of fine mm. that have all gone off yeah, yeah. Who knows how long right. they've gone, yeah, and then sure. they do actually yeah. make associations. Yeah. Yeah, there's still a lot more. Yeah. yeah. yeah all that fine root system is just and then they're actually talking to each other, so yeah, they're actually they're having a chat to the one story. next door, yeah. and they actually find that you know one plant might get attacked by aphids and sort of go, hey, a bit of a warning. There's an influx of aphids, you know, up your natural defence mechanisms as they're coming in. Our mental and physical well-being is a direct result of eating food produced from a healthy soil. A healthy soil needs to be alive. So I'll leave you with Rod and Matthew having a yarn about the way forward and what they used to see on farm. Is it really possible to regenerate our soils? If you have a good rain, we had a good rain a few years ago and we had mushrooms popping up in the paddock and I took that as a real encouraging sign. That's in the middle of the cropping paddock and, and I reckon that's an encouraging sign because if you, if you can see fungal hyphae, 99.9 .9 of them are beneficial. You know, they might only be saprophytic or something like that but they're, they're the good guys, they're the ones you want. And I, I think Australian bugs are a hell of a lot tougher than uh, they give them credit for. It's like all us Australians, mate. I think the fungi and stuff like and the bugs in the ground here are like that at the moment. Their populations have been massively reduced over the years. All the links in the chain have been broken or weakened from chemical farming and I think remnant populations are there and these blokes are just trying to fill the gaps so the remnant you know, the populations can come back and it, you know it's sort of not just giving up NPK, you still got to fertilise but Use the right, you know, use different ones, don't, don't stop, burn the poor little buggers all the stop time. Killing things stop, ki stop, stop killing them and give them a chance to get going again and I think over a period of time it'll, um, it'll prove itself. Yeah.